Okay, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Uh, let's get started. Um, so today, I want to talk about software isolation. So we've seen uh, a whole bunch of techniques already so far to do isolation, you know, ranging from virtual machines or even physical machines to uh, Unix processes to containers that we talked about last week in, in our topic of Lab 2, where you use in Lab 2. And all of these techniques that we've seen so far basically uh, require quite a bit of uh, hardware OS support. You know, think about containers uh, that Radian talked about last week. You know, there's actually quite a bit of machinery below it that the kernel has to support to actually implement uh, containers. And so if there's a bug in, you know, in that implementation or in the kernel implementation, then maybe isolation is out of the wind or just is out of the door. And so an interesting question is, you know, is it sort of possible you know, to do isolation without actually leaning very heavily on the operating system? And that was really uh, the topic of today, basically doing isolation with little or no hardware OS support. And the particular context that we're going to be talking about it is in this context of the paper, which is trying to contain, uh, contain uh, suspect or untrusted code. And so the, the paper uses this term, which is a quite common term for this, namely uh, sandboxing. Um, and the idea here is, is a little bit different, or the emphasis is a little bit different than sort of the isolation techniques that we have looked at so far. Many of the isolation techniques that we looked at so far the goal was sort of keep the attacker out. You know, we have something privileged that we care about, we put a wall around it, and so we want to make sure that the attacker basically can't penetrate through that wall. And what we're going to do here is slightly different. Like what sandboxing does is basically trying to keep the attacker in. What we want to do is, you know, take some piece of code that is untrusted, you know, maybe written by the attacker, or we sort of assume it's written by the attacker, and we want to run it on our, you know, privileged computer. And so we want to put a sandbox around that code so that it can't get out of the sandbox. So here our goal really with you know, sandboxing is basically to keep you know, bad code inside the sandbox. And you might think, wow, you know, this looks ridiculous. Why would you run code supplied by the attacker? That seems ridiculous. You should never do that. But you do that all the time, right? What is an example of actually running code supplied by somebody else you never heard of, never seen, never met, and you're running it on your computer? In fact, probably many of you are doing it right at this point. JavaScript. Yeah, running JavaScript in your browser, correct? So the JavaScript is written by some web developer somewhere, who knows where, and you run it on your computer or on your phone inside of your browser. Right, so that's an example where you're basically taking untrusted code, and basically the first degree you should assume perhaps malicious code, and basically we want to control. You know, we want a sandbox so that can't really do anything bad. And so that's the, sort of the setting. Um, and so there are, quite a, there are different ways of doing uh, software uh, isolation. And, And basically, they sort of fall in sort of two categories. One is language specific. I think, I think, I think uh, JavaScript. You know, the application is written in one particular programming language. You know, like almost all web applications, correct, are written basically in one, you know, programming language. The browser support that programming language, but they execute that, you know, the, the JavaScript in the contained box through the interpreter. 
So there's a JavaScript interpreter that runs inside of your browser. And it executes your JavaScript code and basically enforces a whole bunch of safety mechanisms so that the JavaScript code hopefully can't do anything bad. And so if there's a bug in the interpreter, something bad might happen. But hopefully, you know, the interpreter is small, well written, and has no bugs, and will contain the JavaScript. And that's a very common way of doing things. Uh, uh, you're using a language interpreter. What is a little bit sort of interesting in the paper today is that it actually is language independent. So there's no requirement that the program, so the entrusted code, has to be written in JavaScript. It can be written, in fact, in legacy programming languages like C or C++, and then compiled, and it produces something, an x86 binary, and then you know, the software isolation will make sure that the x86 binary is contained. And they call this native code, where native really refers to the fact that we're going to run x86 instructions, so instructions that the processor just directly understands. Uh, you know, the, the processor doesn't understand you know, JavaScript bytecode immediately, correct? It first has to be translated, interpreted. But here, we're literally going to take instructions that the hardware processor directly understands, and we're going to execute them. And the one goal. You know, one reason that you may want to do that is to get very high performance. So, for example, if you write an application in JavaScript, there's a bit of overhead, you know, for the JavaScript to be interpreted, uh, and you know, that basically slows down the application. And the goal here is basically taking, you know, pre-compiled application that has a highly optimized, you know, x86 set of instructions, and then run those x86 instructions directly. And one of the examples of the paper, you know, there's a couple examples that the paper alludes to, but one of them is, for example, doing physical simulation. You know, you're, you're playing some game, you know, that you want to make the thing interactive, uh, you want it to be faithful, you know, look like the real world, and so you have to run very complex, you know, simulations or modeling code, and you want to run them as high performance as possible, you know, as close as you can get out of the hardware. And that's sort of the uh, target. Does that make sense? And so in some ways, you should think about this. One reason I like this paper is because it seems almost like something impossible. I mean, you're going to take raw code you know, that was generated somewhere, running x86 instruction, you're going to run it directly on the x86 processor, and still the effects of that code will be contained. And so this is like pushing sort of isolation or sandboxing sort of, sort of to the limits. And it makes it interesting. Um, and you know, the. Google people, the authors of this paper, took it very, very seriously, correct? I mean, they actually went and uh, implemented it actually in Chrome. And you can actually run native client inside of your Chrome browser if you want to. Uh, and, but I should say that you know, it's basically on the way out. Uh, Google has decided that they're not going to support it in the future. I think in the next year, they're going to take it out. And, uh, and the main reason why they're not actually supporting it anymore, or are not going to support it anymore, is because there's something else. It's called WebAssembly. That sort of supersedes NACL. And uh, you know, it's also a low level portable code that can be run not directly on the processor, but very little. It's just carefully constructed that there's very, very little overhead in terms of the interpretation. But it also has similar safety properties. And the WebAssembly was clearly, uh, you know, there's a, if you're interested, you know, there's a bunch of good papers about this. They're more programming languages focused and then sort of systems focused. Um, uh, but, but they were clearly uh, inspired or you know, learned from native client. So you can think about this as a long line of work where you know, the current you know, sort of, uh, default approach for actually solving the particular problem that native client wanted to solve, namely running high performance software inside of your browser, is now done with WebAssembly. But it's the same setup. Clear? Any questions? OK. So clear on the motivation, because a lot of people asked, you know, why the heck we were doing this. OK, good. So um, 
So let's talk a little bit about what the organization, what the workflow is, so that we understand what the different pieces are, and then we can dive into the different pieces. So at a high level, native client has the following structure. You, you take some program, maybe like a C program, and you run it for a compiler, say GCC, and it spits out you know, highly optimized x86 code. And then the goal, you know, this is done, for example, uh, at a website, you know, developer, and, you know, the website then pulls up, you know, makes a web page that includes, you know, this uh, pointer beta through this uh, compiled C plus or compiled x86 code. And, you know, when you click on that web page, that x86 code is downloaded over the internet and then sort of being set up and run on your browser or inside of your browser. You know, in the particular case of native client, you would have to install uh, one of the plugins, the native client plugin, you know, that basically arranges all that to happen. So this x86 code, basically the way to think about it, is being sent over the internet you know, to your browser, and on the browser side, uh, it's going to be run. And the way it's being run, it's actually being run in a separate process from the browser, typically. So there's some process that's being created by the native client you know, runtime or the native client plugin, and uh, that's going to run it. But before it actually is run by that process or before it's run directly run on the machine, there is a, a program that sits in between. It's called the validator. And the validator you know, looks at this code, this x86 code, and decides whether it is good x86 code or bad x86 code. And if it's good, then it runs it, or allows, you know, starts a process that runs it, or if it's bad, it rejects it. And in many ways, when the paper you know, talks about the inner sandbox, this is really the inner sandbox. You know, this sort of, or at least the first, you know, the biggest part of the inner sandbox, because it really will establish whether that x86 code is actually safe to run or not safe to run. And so if there's a bug in the validator, then you know, we're going to be in trouble, right? Because maybe the validator will let through some set of an x86 instructions that actually can do something bad, uh, but you know, the validator you know, just missed that. And so the validator is going to be a crucial piece, you know, of this plan. Okay, so there's a couple sort of higher level points we're going to I want to make. So first of all, notice that you know this approach gives us this sort of programming language independent aspect, correct? Because in principle, it could be any compiler or any input language that actually generates x86 code. Secondly, it also gives you this support for legacy applications. So if you have a legacy application still run, you know, written in C, you don't want to port it to JavaScript, maybe too much work, you can actually run it through this, you know, the compiler, get x86 instructions out, and then execute it, you know, with your browser. All right? So the developer gets a sort of this programming language independent uh, support for legacy application. And then finally, it's going to give us, you know, high performance, because we're going to mostly run this x86 instructions directly on the processor. Okay, any questions about the high level picture here? What the architecture is? All clear? Okay. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit about what the goal of this, you know, what the sandboxing goals are. So there's sort of basically two major aspects to it. Uh, one, don't execute uh, disallowed instructions. And so what is an example of a disallowed instruction? Or who even decides which instructions are disallowed and which are not? Yeah, go ahead. Like, for example, a C call. Uh, 
Yeah, right, so what is the x86 opcode for a syscall on Linux? Anyone who picked that up out of the paper? Int, yeah. Right, so there's, a, there's an x86 instruction called int, int, takes one argument, and if you are called with, you know, uh, ox80, that happens to be uh, the way that will transfer control to the operating system and uh, will basically, if you run these on Linux, you know, will invoke a Linux system call. And so they want to disallow that instruction inside of this send box. Why do they want to disallow that instruction? Yeah, it transfers control to the kernel. Not a big deal. Wasn't the kernel written to be actually have no bugs in enforced isolation anyway? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, so their thinking is pretty paranoid, right? Where, you know, they're thinking, how many system calls are there in Linux? Just do. Is it like three, four? A couple hundred, right? You know, and so if you, you know, trigger one of the system calls, maybe with the wrong arguments or tricky arguments that you've picked up, maybe you can exploit some bug in the operating system, right? And usually they wanted to have none of that. Right? They just want to limit, you know, the interaction between this uh, code that runs inside of the box so they can't really even try to interact with the operating system. On the, on the grounds that maybe, you know, that could be dangerous. And it has proven in the past to be dangerous, right? Like once an application is running on side of an operating system and it can execute any system call, you know, things are pretty dicey. And so they're basically taking a paranoid view and you say, we forbid that instruction. You cannot execute the end instruction and that means that, you know, the code running inside of the sandbox just cannot execute system calls at all. You can just cannot interact with the operating system, period. So it's pretty, pretty serious, right? Okay, what are any other examples of disallowed instructions? Like int the only one? Yeah. Red. Yeah, red. You know, we'll talk a little bit later about it, but the return instruction, like your favorite instru instruction probably from lab one, uh, is just not allowed. And we'll see in a second why. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other x86 instructions. x86 instruction set is big, you know, gigantic. So, like, you know, people talk about RISC versus CISC. You know, uh, x86 is the prototypical example of a CISC instruction set that basically contains lots and lots and lots of different features. And some of them are not used much more, some are used uh, a lot. And so there's a lot, a lot of instructions. And so there are also a whole bunch of instructions. They just d disallow, you know, uh, loads GDT. You know, there's a whole bunch of like, global descriptor tables. So a whole bunch of other instructions you've probably never heard of uh, that, you know, they're being disallowed. But well, maybe for this lecture, we should just focus on int and ret, you know, because there are going to be two that's going to show up. Okay, so that's one part. Uh, of course, that is not sufficient, right? Because there's going to be some instructions we're going to allow, because otherwise, you know, the application can't do anything. Uh, but we have the instruction we do allow, you know, we have to contain them a bit. Because what we want to do is uh, we want to make sure that they don't write memory outside of the box. And so in the picture that you should have in your head, you know, while thinking about this uh, aspect is that the code is run in the process, right, in this process, and the process has some layout. Uh, there's multi, you know, different pieces of code in that process, and particularly if you draw, if you draw out what they, uh, one of the figures that is in the paper, uh, there's a, at the bottom is zero, and the first four kilobyte are not being used, then, the next 60 kilobyte, so this is unused. This is the trampoline code. We'll talk a lot about it later. And then um, this is actually the actual module, the NACL module. So this is the untrusted code. And that has, that goes from 64 kilobytes. It's the first instruction to, I think, to, what if a 256 megabyte, I think. 
And then on top of that, there's a runtime system. And that goes up, all the way up. So that's sort of the layout. So if you look inside of this process, you know, uh, the, the way the process is being set up by the NACL uh, system is as follows. 64 byte, you know, the kilobyte at the bottom that is reserved for, as we can see, uh, to enter and exit the runtime system. And then uh, this piece of code or this address range that actually is being used by the module itself. And so when the module executes a, a load instruction or a store instruction for a particular address, we ought to make sure right, that that load and store instruction stay within the bounds of this particular module. And we don't want it to overwrite the runtime system. We don't want to overwrite, you know, the trampoline code. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's uh, talk a little bit more, you know, what the, actually the validator does. Um, and sort of I made it a little bit simplistic, you know, when I talked a little bit earlier. So there are. So save instructions is just going to allow. Right, so if an instruction is of the form like adding two numbers, two constants, and put the result in the registered AIX, you know, that is an example of an uh, instruction that's completely safe to execute. And so they're going to just allow that instruction. Right. Um, then there are instructions that are sometimes safe. So these are instructions that maybe, depending on the arguments with which they called, they're safe or unsafe. So what would be an example of that? I sort of already mentioned it. Yeah, right, so jumping to some address, uh, loading from some address, or storing to some address, right? Because if the store is to an address in the range 64 to 256, then it's okay, right? But if the store instruction is to the trampoline code or to the runtime system, that's not okay. okay? We don't want to overwrite you know, the runtime system. Okay, so this, those are the sometimes safe code, and the, basically the way they're going to deal with that problem is they're going to instrument the sometimes safe uh, instructions. So that they, when called with the appropriate arguments, the safe arguments, they uh, you know, proceed. If they're called with the inappropriate arguments or the unsafe arguments, they don't proceed. And the challenge, as we'll see in a second, is that you know, we want to keep the overhead uh, for instrumentation as low as possible. Right, we could imagine you can, uh, okay. So we want to keep this as low as possible. Okay, and then there are the unsafe instructions, like int, and we're going to disallow those. Okay. So, so here's clearly where a lot of the action is. So let's think a little bit in like what the challenges are and actually building or designing this uh, validator. And so it turns out to be sort of three challenges. One, which I'll talk a little bit in quite a bit of detail about, one is variable length instructions. And the problem here is, you know, if you think about the validator, right, it, what, does it, what is its input? What does it get? It gets x86 code, correct? But does it know it's x86 code? It just gets a set of bytes, correct, from the internet. You know, some website sent us a set of bytes. And so we need to take that set of bytes and actually turn them into instructions, right? We need to decode the set of bytes 
figure out what the instructions are that correspond you know, to that set of bytes. And this turns out to be tricky. Uh, and one reason it's tricky is because the instructions are variable length. And so if you get the wrong instructions or the wrong length for a particular instruction, you might be decoding the wrong, decoding the wrong instructions. And so that's going to be a major problem for them. So even without variable length, it's hard. With variable length, it's even harder. The variable length thing is an x86 specific problem. You know, the memory processors were the instructions are fixed length. And uh, so the decoding doesn't have to deal with the problem that now some instruction is one byte, you know, another instruction is 15 bytes. It just that doesn't happen. So what's an instruction set that is fixed length? Certainly if you're an undergrad at MIT, you should at least know one. RISC-5 Risk five is one. What do you do in 004? RISC-5, right. Used to be the beta. So <laughs> the RISC-5 is a you know, fixed length, or is it easier to parse uh, decode instruction than the x86 is. OK. Um, so the second challenge that we haven't talked about, I just mentioned that as a goal, when we have to figure out how to do it, which is guarding you know, the load, store, and jump arguments. And then the final thing, uh, we have the range. You know, there has to be some way of actually you know, starting to run this code. Right? So there has to be some way to enter a module. And there also has to be a way for a module to exit. And so there has to be some plan for entering and exiting a module. And why? Why is it important that we can actually exit the module? And then enter it again. Why would that happen? Yeah. Uh, if it's like being scheduled in and out, like we'll answer that if we'll like yield. I don't know. Like yeah, they have some ports for yield, but that was not what we're trying to get at. Yeah. Oh, other modules? Yeah. You know, it's unlikely, correct, that a module can just run completely isolated and be useful. It's very likely that it actually has to interact, you know, with some other pieces of the system to actually get its job done, right? In particular, it probably has to interact with the page from which it was launched in the web browser, right? There's probably information in that page that maybe the module needs. And so there has to be a way for the module to communicate back, you know, to the browser, right? So, if the module runs inside of the browser, you know, there has to be some way to communicate back to the page. Another process that the browser may have that actually contains the actual web page, right? And so, and so and the way they're going to facilitate that is through this runtime system. And the runtime system is basically in charge of actually being able to communicate with other modules using some form of RPC. Right, so there's some communication channel between the runtime system and the browser for RPC. And basically, this module code can ask you know, the runtime, please do something for me. And the way it does it is you know, that will cause it to jump into the trampoline code. The trampoline code will transfer control to the runtime system. And then the runtime system will actually do its, do its job. OK, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in, uh, in, in detail. Uh, but that, is an additional challenge, correct? Because now we got a, uh, you know, the module is allowed to ask the runtime system for services. So if you think a little bit about this, this sounds a lot like an application asking the operating system for service, correct? Like execute the int, you know, system, uh, instruction to get the operating system to do so something. And basically, it looks like now we're doing exactly the same thing. You know, the module can actually ask the runtime system to do things for it. So what should we be worried about? Well, if you were an attacker and you wanted to arrange something bad to happen, then what would be one venue? Let's say you can't find a bug in the validator. Jump to a bug in 
Yeah, or maybe another way of saying that is, Craig, you, know, you, can, you get to choose what arguments you pass to the runtime system, right? And so if there's a bug in the runtime system that you can trigger by supplying the right arguments, maybe you can get something bad to happen, right? You know, think about like almost lab one, right? Like by just pa passing a long, long, long string you know, to you know, the website, you can actually get the website to do something for you that you know, it was not intending to do so. And so maybe you know, there are gonna be equivalent kind of type bugs like that in the runtime system. And so the runtime system is definitely you know, part of the sort of trusted computing base, right? That has to be bug free. It's completely trusted. So who writes the runtime system? Is that also supplied over the internet by an arbitrary website? The creators of NSEO? Yeah, the Knuckle guys you know, built the runtime system, and presumably they've been very, very careful about it, right? Um, and in fact, how paranoid are they? Do they think bugs are just impossible in the runtime system? Or is it like the runtime system the final line of defense? You know, once, you know, if there were a bug in the runtime system, then, you know, game's over. What of which two of the two stories is true? Yeah, go ahead. That's where the outer sandbox comes in. Yeah, this is where the outer sandbox comes in. Right? They're so paranoid that you know, even you know, they, even though all their first line defense is all based on the validator and you know the runtime system actually being written correctly, they do worry that they have a bug. And what they do is like basically use all the previous approaches that we talked about in the last pre like, couple lectures and use that as an outer sandbox. So this box, you know, this sandbox code, correct, is running inside of this process. They don't just run an ordinary Unix process. Now they use, run an ordinary Unix process with a bunch of additional features. For example, they limit the number of system calls. And so even if you, if the attacker were able sort of to get the runtime system to do something that one person actually not intending to do, uh, it is the case that the outer sandbox uh, enforces that the process can't actually make that many different uh, kinds of system calls. Does that make sense? So why does the runtime system actually have to make any system calls at all? Well, it has to be able to communicate, right? You know, otherwise the whole point of the runtime system where it was there to be able to communicate back to the browser. So at least, you know, it has to be some minimal set of system calls that allow you to read and write, you know, probably from a file descriptor to communicate, you know, through some channel, you know, to another module or to the browser. So at least those system calls have to be allowed. But there's, as we said earlier, correct, like Linux has hundreds of system calls, and so they just disallow most of them. Another question you can ask is, okay, why not, if we're gonna have an outer sandbox, why have the inner sandbox? The outer sandbox is really well done. There shouldn't be any reason to have an inner sandbox. Right? You know, the security is as weak as the weakest link, correct? And so one of two is gonna be weak. And if we really believe that the outer strong the sandbox is really good, then why have the inner one? So let's spend all our energy in making the outer sandbox as bulletproof as possible and waste no time on the inner. Right? Don't divide our attention. Yeah? It's hard not to write bugs. Sorry? Because it's hard not to write bugs. Yeah, it's hard not to write bugs. So, you know, the, the thing to remember here is they're writing, they want to run on multiple operating systems. Right? They want to run on Windows, they want to run on Mac OS, they want to run on Linux. And those have all slightly different stories for actually how to do isolation. And they're just worried that you know, they're just not perfect. And so for them, the outer sandbox is really sort of the way to think about it is sort of defense in depth. It's really about the inner sandbox. They really want to make that right. They're worried that they still have a little bug, you know, maybe in the runtime system or maybe in the validator. And so they just for extra precaution, you know, put an outer sandbox around it to limit any damage that might have caused if you escape out of the inner sandbox. But it's just like a backup, you know, sort of real defense, line of defense in depth. Okay, does that make sense? 
And a lot of people ask the question or by email, like, you know, what's the role exactly of the address inbox? So that's clear. OK. So basically, we're going to ignore the outer sandbox. And we're going to mostly focus on the inner sandbox, because that's the first line of defense. And we want to see you know, how a good job uh, that does. OK. OK, so let's try to understand the first challenge, you know, what is hard about it. Um, and so here, an example of decoding. to illustrate you know, what can go wrong. So let's say you know, there's sort of a sequence of bytes that are coming in over the internet, correct, that the validator reads, and now it has to decide what instructions are is that sequence of bytes. So let's assume, as a case study, let's take a sequence of bytes. You know, it's 25 hex CD 08, uh, sorry, 80, and then a couple more zeros. Uh, so this is, I think, a five-byte instruction, correct? One byte, two, three, four, yeah, five bytes. And we now want to know what the instruction actually is. So we can look in the x86 manuals. Right? They actually tell you, you know, if you see a byte of this form, it has this particular value, and the first couple bits are the opcode. We can figure out like what the actual instruction is. So if you do this. And you read the manual carefully, you know, you can discover that this, if you start here, that this instruction uh, is an end instruction of AIX, register AIX, with the constant OX0000. CD. So starting at that. You, know, you can just look at the manual, and you can reconstruct that, that this is the case. And this is exactly what the validator does, correct? The validator basically has a big of tables inside of it that basically you know, take the bits and try to figure out what the instruction is. Yeah? challenge to, to this, because doesn't the browser have to execute the decode in order to run it anyways? So why can't you just use a procedure of the browser to decode? The, the browser doesn't run x86 instructions directly, correct? The only good, the, the, uh, code that the, that the browser runs that is foreign, that's untrusted, is JavaScript code. And so the JavaScript code is compiled down, if you will, or jitted you know, at runtime to x86 instructions. And so the validator, you know, which is the first line of defense here, correct, for this story, you know, has to look at the sequence of bytes and try to figure out what the instructions are. OK, so nothing bad so far, correct, because it's all perfectly fine. You know, so if you start here. You know, this is this uh, instruction. Is this a safe instruction? Ah, it looks pretty safe, right? You know, it's a constant and we're sticking into an AIX. You know, how bad can that be? Okay, but now let's say we got slightly confused, right? And you know, we did something wrong and we start actually the instruction decoding here. So that's a second byte. Well, you have to go look in your x86 manuals uh, to figure out what that instruction is. But I can tell you what it is. This turns out to be int ox, oops, ox80. So this is our, do we want to allow this instruction? Absolutely not, all right? So if in some way the validator gets confused about what actual instruction it actually is, might be decoding, and for example, gets the instruction length wrong, correct? Maybe the instruction before it was five you know, bytes, the, and, uh, and, the, and the validator decided over oh, seven. And so now the next instruction that decodes is the end instruction, or the other way around, you know, we might be in trouble. So it's important that basically we get these instruction boundaries right, right? Because we might otherwise miss the fact that there's an end instruction sitting there. And so what does this mean? Well, what it really means is we can't, we got to make absolutely sure that when we execute a jump instruction, that the jump instruction doesn't get, you know, jumps in here, correct, and by two. The jump instruction bytes, uh, jumps to by zero, it's fine. If it bytes to by two, and then we allow that in the validator, then, you know, we're actually, the, the module code will be running a forbidden instruction. Does that make sense? So we got to be a little bit careful. Um, 
one thing, of course, we could do is we could look at the byte stream that comes in, correct? And just say, like, ah, anywhere we see CD80, we can just disallow that instruction. We just, like, remove it. Is that a valid plan? Now, it's not going to be a valid plan because then our benign instruction, which happens to include that sequence of bytes, you know, would not be able to execute, right? So we got to, you know, be a little bit sophisticated about this. OK, so, uh, so what is their solution? The solution I call, this is what I call a reliable disassembly. And the way you know, they're going to do is they're going to take the sequence of bytes, and uh, they're going to run a two-phase, basically, algorithm on it to uh, make sure that uh, you're never going to jump in the middle of an instruction. And so the way they're going to do it in phase one, they're going to build a jump table or a target table with all possible, with all addresses of instructions. The basic plan is extremely simple. You know, the program we know starts at 64 kilobyte. Right? So the first instruction is at 64 kilobyte. We're going to read the first byte of that first instruction, and then we're going to you know, play the game and do the instruction decoding. Okay, so, for example, if the first byte you know, was 25, we know it's an nth instruction, and we take the next five bytes. Right? And we know it in our table that 0 is a valid target. And we note in our table that 5 is a valid target, because that's the next instruction after the end instruction. Right? And we're just going to go through the whole byte stream and basically keep a list of where all the instruction start addresses are. And then the second phase is then we're going to go back and we're going to look for all the jump instructions and look at the argument of a jump instruction. And just check whatever target is in the jump instruction actually is in our table. Right? So if, for example, the uh, so for example, if the, uh, the module had an instruction that say uh, jump five, then the validator will say, okay, that's perfectly fine because there's actually a, lit, a legit you know, instruction there, right? If the module, for example, had a jump two. In the code, what would the validator do? Would it allow it or would it disallow it? It would reject it, right? Because two is not in the target in the jump table, in the target table, and so this is not allowed. Does that make sense? Yeah? Go one by one for the instruction stream, right? You, you know where the first instruction starts, you parse it. Then you know where the second instruction starts. You parse that or disassemble it. Then you do the third instruction, then the fourth instruction, and the fifth until you get to the end. And then you're done. So now back to the homework question. What if that, we get that wrong? Like the validator gets the parsing of instructions wrong. So it thinks you know, the next instruction starts at address 5 because it's a, thinks it's a 5-byte instruction. But in reality, it was a 3-byte instruction or 7-byte instruction. What could go wrong? Yeah. Go ahead. You might think you're reading the end, but you're actually it's going to execute the end. Yeah. You think you know the validator thinks you, the code will execute the end instruction, but it turns out you know the code will be actually allowed to run the uh, end instruction because you got the length, the addresses wrong, right? If you jump target tables wrong, then you know the code that actually runs might be jumping to an address where, just unfortunately, the end instruction is there. All right. Does it make all sense? OK, good. So that deals uh, with this problem of like jumping in the middle of instruction, because we're just not, we're going to try to make it very hard to do that. This only works you know, for jump instructions where there's a, the opcode is immediately visible. Right? Uh, this won't work for 
computed jump instructions. So for example, if you have a jump instruction, so this, is, this works well for this type of jump instruction, like where there's a constant or something like that, you know, jump to OX5. But it doesn't work well if you know, the jump instruction is like go jump through AAX. Right, so AX is a register. Let somebody put you know, a value into that AX, and the code now jumps through that AX. Then the validator correct, can't know whether that jump instruction goes to a valid address or not, right? because it's computed at runtime. You know, based on runtime arguments. So the validator can't figure out whether this is correct, um, if this is legit or not. So, so there's where the second sort of cleverness comes in. Uh, and the basic idea that they have is to uh, get help from the compiler. Gonna, there's going to be some agreement. There's some room to play here, right? There's some x86 code generated by a compiler, and then there's the validator that checks you know, whether you know, the compiler actually obeys the rules. And so basically what the game they're going to start playing is to say, well, we're going to sort of generate code that follows certain rules. So they're going to modify the compiler so that it will generate code and that you know, obeys some rules, and then the validator will check whether actually you know, the compiler followed those rules. Does that make sense? Let's see where the opportunity is you know, to actually do something about this problem. And so what is the particular idea that they have is a jump instruction, like jump AAX, when the compiler is about to generate that code, it actually generates slightly something slightly different. And in fact, what it generates is two instructions, one an int. Uh, if I, let's see if I can get all the numbers right. So int o x uh, x, I think it's f f, f f, f f, f f. So this is one byte, two byte, three bytes, four bytes. And I guess well, the last one is uh, e0. And then aax. Let me explain in a second what I, and then do a jump to AX. So we're basically what they're doing is adding what they, really what this end instruction is tended to do is cut off the bottom five bits of the address there where the jump is jumping to. So what does that do? What do we know about this jump? Where's the jump going to go to? Yeah, it has to be aligned with a multiple of 32. So we know that the only place that this indirect jump, this computed jump, can to, to is an address which mod 32 is zero. Right? So it's not an arbitrary address anymore. You know, it has at least some properties. And that turns out to be sufficient for us to actually, or to be sufficient for the NACL people to sort of get the indirect jump, the computed jump, to work. So where do computed jumps show up? Like when you compile a program, like a C program or a C++ program, when does sort of this, when does it, like, when do you need one of these computer jumps? A little bit important to understand. Yeah? You might need it for like a switch statement where you're doing like kind of a lookup table type things. Or yes, I think the, the, most of those can be computed statically by the compiler. The compiler can analyze you know, what the destination address is. Like the place where it really shows up is in uh, virtual method calls in C++, right, where uh, you have an object, and based on the type of the object, you call a different method. And, and the compiler, the way the compiler does that is well, it looks at the type, generates some code, correct, that looks into the type, and then places the right you know, method address into AOX and then jumps to AAX. Right, so that has to be done at runtime. But what does the compiler know? The compiler does know what all the sort of valid addresses are that can show up in the jump table, correct? Because it's a bunch of methods calls that are supported by you know, the you know, C++. And so the programmer has written them. And so the compiler does know where they, what those addresses are. And so the second part of this plan is to change you know, these jumps to uh, a 32-byte aligned address. 
And what the, but the other piece, what does the compiler have to do? Yeah, put all the targets, all possible targets, at the 32 byte aligned address, right? Does that make sense? Well, that's the two things that the compiler does. Right, the compiler generally replaces this one jump instruction uh, with these two uh, byte instructions. So every jump instruction is now a little bit more expensive because you actually could do two instructions instead of one, and hopefully not too bad. And furthermore, the compiler, if it wants to make sure that actually code will run in the end, it has to make sure that whatever possible targets of those jump instructions, those uh, computer jump instructions, are 32 byte aligned. Right, so the compiler has to follow the rules. And so, okay, what does now the what does the validator do? So let's see the validator runs into this sort of jump EAX. What does, what does it have to check? So the validator again then gets a bunch of bytes over the network, correct? It's like decoding happily along, and then suddenly, you know, it sees jump AAX, right? What is the check that the, the, the simple check that the validator has to do to make sure to allow this instruction to proceed? Is the previous line still? Yeah, check if the previous instruction has the appropriate end there, right? And if it is the case, then you know we're going to just allow it. Yeah. Uh, how does the end make sure that it's 32 bytes? Oh, it cuts off the. This is the. E0, so maybe let me erase this and make it more clear what the last two bytes are of this instruction. E0. So forget all the other ones. So what is, so there's a zero, what is E in binary? One, 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 zero, I believe, correct? So how many bits is this? It's five bits, correct? And this is hex, so there's one byte, and then here's the second byte, this is the E, so there's five bits, so it cuts off the five bottom bits using the end. Good? It always comes down to these like really nitty gritty details. <laughs> uh, but this is the, <laughs> the important part, okay? Okay, good. Now, you know, there are a little couple, you know, this is the basic plan, there's a couple of gotchas. You know, you got to be a little bit careful. Uh, and so we need to think a little bit about it. So let's say the compiler is happily generating, coming along, and it's about to generate an instruction. Maybe it's actually about to generate this instruction. And it, you know, just crosses a 32-byte bi boundary. So for example, maybe, you know, the boundary is exactly here. Would that be bad? Right? That would be bad, right? So the compiler has to be a little bit careful, and the validator has to check it. And so what is, what, what is the option for the compiler? You, can, you, know, you can't do that, right? I mean, you can't have an instruction like that cross a 32-byte boundary. Yeah, right. They just that instruction yeah, they just like the, there's two things going on. The compiler just, just no, a good compiler does not generate instructions that you know, cross a 32-byte boundary address, and the way it does it, it just sticks a bunch of no-op instructions that do nothing. And how long is a no-op instruction on the x86? One byte, so you can always play that game, right? So if you're 29, you're like 31 bytes, you know, used by instructions, and you generate the next instruction and would cross the 32 byte, or just stick one no-op in, it's now at a 32 byte, you know, you're back into a 32 byte, you know, block, and you start to generate the instruction there. So then a good compiler does this, what does the validator have to do? Check that the compiler did it, right? Yeah. <laughs> you cannot allow instructions that pass a 32 byte boundary, and it has to reject those, right? So again, so it's a play, interplay, you know, the compiler has to do the right thing, but the only thing that the validator does is check that the compiler did it. Okay, so the validator is not generating those instructions. This is what, like, one part that's clever about this scheme, correct, is that the complicated part 
you know, we're computing and figuring out what instruction to generate is all done by the compiler, which basically is untrusted because the validator is the one that checks that the compiler did the right thing. And checking is much easier than actually doing the generation. So we see here, correct, that the validator is really, really important. How big is it, the validator? You know, you sort of, you, you, the general line of you know, farming, correct, like more lines of code, more bugs. And we know a bug in the validator is bad, or could be potentially very bad. So we want no bugs in the validator. How small is the validator? 600 lines of code. Yeah, there's 600 lines of code, right? And that was all what it is. Uh, and so this is intentionally, right? Because they're trying to push the hard work out to the compiler, and the only thing that the validator does is checking. And they can check in 600 lines of code. OK. Um, boom, 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 boom. OK, there's one more uh, issue that you, know, you brought up earlier which is uh, uh, the return instruction. So what does the return instruction do? You know, since you're experts you know, from this from lab one, what does the instru inter return instruction do? Yeah. It uh, pops the save return address off the stack and then does some stuff and then it jumps to that address. Yeah, so correct, so it takes an address off the stack and then jumps to it. What does that look like in our story? It looks like a computed jump, right? Where the value is generated, you know, supplied by the program, by the module, and then we jump into it. So that's risky, right? Because it's basically, it's a computed jump. And so what's the solution that NACL uses? It forbids return instructions. You know, the compiler does just not generate return instructions. Well, the compiler is supposed to generate no return instructions. And the validator just checks. If it sees a return instruction in the instruction stream, it says, too bad, you cannot run that code. Of course, the compiler has to do something, right? Because you can't just delete the return instructions because your code wouldn't run anymore. So what does it do? You know, what, does it, what does it generate? So basically it generates, you know, it's almost the same thing as here. What it actually generates, it and there's these instructions, but before this, it ran one more instruction, which is basically pop the current, you know, the return address off into AIX. And then it ends it with AIX, and then jumps to it, right? And again, here we see a game going on. The compiler has to, you know, if the compiler wants to have some hope that its code will be executed, it has to follow that rule, and the validator just checks that the compiler did follow that rule. And so this is how the return instruction is resolved, correct? And so a single return instruction now generate, you know, turns into one or two more instructions. So the return has gotten a little bit more expensive. But hopefully not too bad, right? Because, you know, so far we have not added that many instructions actually to the, to the instruction stream. Yeah? So uh, you have like um, a system only, uh, system calls. Yeah. And the address of that uh, function is 32 byte line. Mm -hmm. You could potentially put that in the EX set that return address, you could potentially jump to that instruction even after having this safety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. But like what happened before? We know all the instruction boundaries, correct? The instruction boundaries, you know, we got from the target table. And we know what the big instructions are at the beginning of each of these targets. Right? And so if there's an int instruction that does a system call, we already forbid it. You, know, you were not allowed to do that anyway. So this is not going to be a problem. Right? We know Every instruction that is at a legit instruction address is a valid or a safe instruction to execute. OK, good. All right, so basically, that solved this problem. All right, so we have two more you know, problems to go. Maybe take it offline. We're No, you know it's a 32-byte aligned 
boundary. And so the validator has to check that every 32-byte aligned address, there is a valid instruction there. And if there's an int instruction, just disallow it. Yeah? It seems this is entirely contingent on being able to reliably decode x86. Yeah, so it's not yeah. Yeah. That's where the uh, essence is, correct? You know, can you actually, is this possible? How big is the uh, x86 manual? You have multiple volumes, you know, anybody who's, you know, and many, many pages, thousands of pages. Ah, this looks tricky. So what they, uh, so what did they do about this? Because like, how, why do they have any confidence that their validator is correct? Like everything, you know, the whole crux of this approach is the validator. Now it's okay, 600 lines. So maybe you know, it didn't make that many bugs, but you know, 600 lines, you can still make bugs. Particularly if the instruction set is very complex, right? Yeah. Yeah, so they looked at the manual and said, like, oh, there's a whole bunch of instructions that really no code should be using anyway. So we're just going to disallow them. We're not going to even think about them. We're not going to consider them. So they don't really run the whole x86 instructions set. They only run a subset of them. Because there are all kinds of weird instructions that set a bit that basically say, like, you know, this instruction should be executed atomically or you know, like some properties. And just, they ignore, blow off those instructions. That means the compiler can generate them, right? And so one concern that we should have is, like, well, can you really compile Likert seq programs? Maybe you know you have to re first rewrite them. And, and what was the story in the paper? Yeah, they tried to validate this, correct? Was it much work to take existing C programs and to make them run with NACL? Was it no work? No, it was a little bit of work, right? Like from one of these applications, they had to change ten lines of code to actually you know get the compiler to generate the right code, but like not a ton, ton of work. All right. So that's part of the story. Uh, in fact, they were very, very concerned about this. And so they run uh, a whole bunch of you know, bug finding contests. Uh, and, uh, and they fussed you know, the x86 instruction set like uh, crazily, you know, tried all kinds of weird combinations, see what an x86 instruction did. Um, and they had competitions for you know, people to try to break the validator. And in fact, they had bugs. You know, there were people that did find uh, bugs in their decoding and were able to basically break out of the sandbox because of that. Of course, they fixed the bugs. And that's why they had an open competition, but that was one way. So they had a bunch of different approaches to actually try to validate that the, uh, the, the <laughs> validate the validator, <laughs> making sure that it actually is correct. All right. They also discovered some interesting properties. Did anybody remember, like, the paper hinted this at a couple places. Yeah, basically they triggered bugs inside of the x86. You know, like they fuzz the instructions, so they make generating instructions that no legal program really or no normal program would execute, and apparently the x86 processor does something bad in some of those cases. Right? And just basically stops running. You know, the x86 processor inside, correct, is an incredibly complex you know, beast, and so it's not surprising that there are bugs in, you know, if there's bugs in software, there's gonna be bugs in hardware, like, you know, complexity, bugs. All right. And so, what? Uh, in fact, so these instructions, they're basically, they go on the, you know, disallow list, right? You know, instructions that actually. Uh, okay, but this definitely is a major concern. You know, the you, know, you have to really understand the x86. You have to understand the semantics of the instruction. You know, rumors are that only Intel actually understands what the, <laughs> the instructions do, and so there is a bit of a risk here. But they try to count it up by fuzzing, running competitions, you know, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, there's a, if you're really excited about this kind of stuff, there's a, uh, they had another group of researchers work on a verified validator. So basically they wrote a validator and they wrote down what they think are the semantics of x86 instructions and then, then proved, you know, that the validator incorrectly uh, disassembled the instructions. Uh, the, the particular paper is called Rock Salt, if you uh, care about, which is, of course, a pun on Nackel. Okay. Good, good, good. Okay, so now we're back to like the two more problems that we sort of need to deal with. Um, 
So the word first, let's talk about the first one, or the second one, I guess, on that list, which is uh, regarding you know, load, store, jump. All right, so far, you know, like we spend a lot of time thinking about jumps, and, and we know for absolutely sure that jumps, you know, when they jump inside of a module, they will jump to a legit instruction. But we didn't really say anything about, like, you know, how do they make sure that the jump instruction doesn't go into the runtime, right? And maybe the runtime actually has somewhere in the middle some instructions that actually, you know, contain int, and uh, the module jumps into that. So we've got to make sure, right, that the module just cannot jump to any, actually, we just want to disallow the module to directly jump into the runtime at all. And so we have to have some plan. Similarly for loading the store instructions, we want to have to make sure that the store instructions you know, don't overwrite in the runtime, because the runtime is the one that actually communicates with the outside world, correct? And then we'll be in trouble. So there has to be some plan. Um, and there's sort of two ways you could go about this. Uh, one, you know, solution would be to say, well, you know, the load and the store take an argument, right? like you know, a register that contains the address to which the store needs to happen. So what could we do? So if you had to implement NACL, you know, what, 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 what scheme could you use? Could you use schemes that are similar to the ones that we talked about so far? So I, you know, just like, let's cook up some schemes, you know, just for sort of fun. Uh, so we gotta, we wanna make sure that the jump doesn't go above 256. Ah, that feels very similar to this, you know, the thing that we just did, right? So what could we do? You know, in addition to that end instruction, we just ended a little bit more, right? We wanna make sure that it never can outside of the 256, we basically cut off the top bits, right? So that it's basically always below 256, and then we'd be in business. Right? And could we do something similar with stores and loads? Yeah, you know, sure, it has an argument. We could just, you know, wrap it up in a bunch of more instructions to double check, you know, that the address that the load the store is going to is actually valid. That make sense? You know, so that means that the compiler maybe has to generate a little bit more work, correct? And then the validator has to check, you know, that, you know, these instructions are added by the compiler. And we have to make one other thing sure. We gotta make sure that these set of instructions fit in 32 bytes, right? We can't span a boundary, so it just has to fit in the 32 bytes. But if we can almost make that work, we could do that, right? Does that make sense? Um, and that's basically solution one. And, uh, but it turns out on, and this is actually the solution they use on the 64-bit x86. So 64-bit 86, x86, instrument, a bit more. Okay, so just wrap all the loads and stores and jumps in a couple more instructions that and double check that you know, they're going to the right places. What's the downside of this plan? Yeah, overhead, right? Like now we're turning a load, you know, into maybe four or five instructions. And so they're very worried that now we're not running any more native speed anymore, right? And the whole goal was to run at native speed. And, um, you know, it turns out, you know, there's a paper, there's a follow-on paper that discusses their implementation for the 64-bit uh, x86. And, you know, it definitely has a little bit more overhead than the 32-bit one, but not dramatic. And so this is a valid plan. And there are a bunch of optimizations you can do. You can be very clever uh, and try to reduce, you know, the number of instructions. Uh, but the, the, in the end, it just boils down to actually instrumenting very cleverly. So that's one option. On the 32-bit x86, they take advantage of uh, a feature that the 32-bit has, but the 64-bit doesn't, which is called segmentation. And what is segmentation? It turns out that uh, there's an additional set of registers on the x86, the 32-bit one. It's called the segment registers. A 
example, for code, there's a segmentation register called CS. And for uh, data, there's a register called DS, data segment. And for the stack, there's a register called SS, stack segment register. And basically, these are numbers that jump into a table or that point to a table, which is called a descriptor table. And this descriptor table basically contains for each one of them two fields, a base and a length. And what they do is very simple. They set the base to whatever 64 or 0, actually, 0x0. And they set the length to what? what will you guess me? 256, right? Not the right. And what this does, basically, any instruction, so a jump is a code instruction. And so when the jump instruction is executed, the hardware in parallel says, OK, okay this is a jump instruction. Let me see what the bounds are for jumps by looking at the entry for CS. So here's the CS entry. It says, ah, oh, base is 0, jumps 256. So if it's inside, the processor will allow it. If it's outside, the processor will just not execute the instruction and return, basically uh, 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 generate an exception. Okay? And that's the same thing for, you know, basically DS and CS all have the same values. So this is basically, so how much overhead does this add? Well, you know, we don't really know exactly because who knows how cleverly Intel is implemented, but in principle, sort of, it almost looks free, right? Because the hardware just does it for us while we're running the, uh, the instruction, okay? And so using segmentation, basically, they get the bound checking, you know, this problem number two, the guarding of the instructions almost for free. And there's like no way for an instruction to jump basically to the runtime system once you set up the code segments correctly. Okay? Any questions about this? Okay, so that's one more clever idea that they, that they used. And other people have done something similar in the past, you know, with software fault isolation schemes. And they're not the first to play this trick. Okay, so now let's more, uh, talk a little bit about the last problem. Uh, entering and exiting the module. But let's first do exit. So we want to go from the module to the runtime system. For example, we want to ask in the browser for something. And it has to be done with a bit of care, correct? Because we just forbid that the module actually can jump into the runtime system by setting up the segmentation registers. So how do they do that? How do they arrange? Yeah. Yeah, using the trampoline. So what is a trampoline? Yeah, it's a jump, exactly. So that's exactly the analogy you should do. You know, there's something you can jump. You know, by jumping on it, you can end up somewhere else. And, and the jump is very controlled. You know, the trampoline controls where you jump to. And so the trampoline is at a 32-byte aligned address. And there's just a bunch of instructions that are sitting there. And so the code can jump to it, correct? Because it's a 32-byte aligned address, so the module can actually jump to it. And at that 32-byte aligned address, there's a couple instructions that basically what they do, if you want to think about it, they reprogram the code segment selector to increase the length, you know, to the, to the including the runtime system. And then what's called a long jump, and the way they do that is through what's called a long jump in the x86 terminology, where that basically resets the code segment selector to allow jumps to something far away. And so here in this, you know, this, this, this is a bunch of trusted code that the trampoline, that they wrote that basically jumps, you know, you can jump from the module into the trampoline. The trampoline has a few number of instructions that fit in that 32 byte uh, window because otherwise it can't overlap, correct? So it has to fit in 32 bytes. And through that 32 bytes, we can jump into the runtime system. Now, this looks like pretty good, except, you know, you should be a little bit alarmed about this, correct? Because, you know, what if the module, correct? The module store instructions are bounded by, you know, the segmentation registers, and the segmentation register says 0 to 256, correct? And so a store instruction could overwrite you know, without actually, you know, clearly, you can't do it, but, you know, we have to worry about this. 
the story structure could overwrite like the trampoline code, right? And maybe then do something that the module wants. Like jump into an arbitrary location in the runtime system where, for example, just happens to be the int instruction sitting there. So what's the story on that? I have to bulletproof off this design. Yeah, you know, the code section is read-only. I mean, you just can, like, they, uh, they're actually a little bit fuzzy in the paper exactly how they do it, uh, but it might be that they use the VM virtual memory system to basically, from the process, basically to make the that pages, those VM pages, to be read-only or execute-only. And so then you can't write to them, all right? But that's a crucial part, again, of the story, correct? Like, all these little details have to be taken care of because if you miss any of these details, that might actually be an escape out of the sandbox. That make sense? Okay. Um, and, you know, the return is something similar. You know, basically the runtime jumps somewhere into the trampoline and then the trampoline, they call it the uh, spring, springboard. You know, there's a springboard in the, this code that allows you to go from the runtime to the through a springboard back into a module. And basically what the, you know, the springboard does it actually sets up the code segment selector correctly so that you can then, after that, you're contained uh, in that. And they're a little bit smart about it because they, where does the springboard sit? Does the springboard sit at a 32 byte aligned address? No, because that would be dangerous, correct? And because then the module could be jumping there and we don't want that. So where they put the, the first instruction in the springboard is a halt instruction. So if ever the module would jump into the springboard, it would execute, you know, it has to jump to a 32-byte aligned address, right? And the first instruction there is a halt instruction, and so the program would stop right away. And so that protects them against that problem. And, but of course, the runtime, it is allowed to jump to any address. It doesn't, it's restricted to a 32-byte. So the first instruction of the springboard sits right after the halt instruction. And that instruction that sets up the code segment selector and then jumps into the uh, code, yeah. Uh, because uh, the, 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 who knows whether it actually is dangerous, but the risk is, of course, that there's some instruction that the attacker could exploit to, for example, reprogram the code segment selector to actually be very permissive and not, you know, be restricted to 64 kilobytes. And just to be careful that, you know, there's just not, none of those opportunities exist, you know, they set this up as extra <laughs> guarantees. Okay? Okay, good. Um, okay, so let's uh, take a step back. Uh, any questions further about uh, this whole design and plan? Um, so we already talked quite a bit about like uh, security evaluation, correct? We talked about uh, what are the attack surfaces, uh, the runtime, you know, the validator. And we have some confidence maybe that did a good job on that, correct? We talked about performance. You know, the overhead is you know, cl clearly can be that big. And if you look at the experiments in the paper, you, know, you see that the overhead is in some cases like one of a few percent on like computational intensive applications. So that's cool. Um, uh, and it turns out porting applications to NACL is also not that much work. So it seems like a pretty, you know, pretty, pretty cool plan. Uh, so stepping one step back, you know, what we've seen here, correct, is uh, Sort of a summary. What we've seen here is a software approach, software isolation. And in some ways, as I said in the beginning of the lecture, you might think, oh, this, this should be impossible, right? You know, you can take arbitrary code that somebody wrote and you can sandbox it and run it safely. And, you know, you, can, you see here, uh, you know, the first time I read about these kinds of schemes, I was like mighty impressed because, you know, it's pretty clever. It's pretty cool that you can just take arbitrary x86 code, validate it, and have confidence that, you know, basically it's run safely. And so uh, and you see this sort of kind of thinking showing up in a whole bunch of different places. You know, we, this is one case study where people took it very, very serious. Uh, but like, uh, even like in the context of web assembly, you know, it's not th exactly those tricks like the ones we are on the board, but they're similar type of thinking, you know, thinking very hard about the control flow 
of the program to make absolutely sure that the control flow stays in you know, the appropriate bounds so that we can actually draw some safety you know, properties out of that. Right? And so it's very cool uh, that you can do this and that this is even possible. You don't need you know, hardware support for virtual memory or an operating system. You basically, you can use this approach, correct, on different operating systems might have different support to an isolation and you want extra, guarantee, extra safety, then you can use our approach like a software isolation. Um, the other probably two points that I should make is that, you know, even though uh, NACL is actually, as I said, on the way out, you know, Chrome is gonna uh, not support it anymore. Any reason why you think this is the case? Why is this not an overwhelming success? Why are we not using this all in our today? Seems like a great plan. Yeah. Yeah, phones are not x86, so that's a problem. So they did actually have a follow on on, uh, on a NACL called PNACL, portable NACL, uh, which basically you know, LLVM is the intermediate language, and then they do a little bit of co generation in the, on, the, on the client side. Um, any other? So that's a good reason. So they worked on it a bit, but yeah. JavaScript is pretty fast. Uh, but not fast enough that we don't have web assembly, right? So, you know, the basic problem that these guys were trying to address is a real problem, right? And, you know, web assembly is another answer to that, uh, that same problem. So I don't know. <laughs> My speculation is that, you know, the Chrome is only one browser, right? And so there's the Firefox, there's, you know, Microsoft browser, and uh, I'm not clear, like, web assembly went sort of a different road. It's like an open standard. And I'm not sure whether the Google guys you know, or the NACL guys push hard enough in terms of making an open standard, or maybe that was impossible. But one speculation is that other browsers are not supporting it. Right? It's clear that other browsers are not supporting it, and that means it may, it's not so useful, because if you have a website and you want to use NACL, you know, only people that have Chrome can run it and nobody else. And so that's probably one reason why this hasn't been an overwhelming success and why you use it, use it daily. But the basic ideas are really good ideas. Okay. See you on Wednesday.